Good morning, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of uh, Friday Morning Apocalypse with Martin Popoff and Pete Pardo. Today is part two of our series on perfect albums. So these are the albums that we deem perfect from start to finish. There's no skipping any track. We absolutely love each and every song on the album. We love everything about the album. We can listen to the album ad nauseum. Still to this day, if it's an old album, if it's a newer album, we're going to continue listening to it. So, uh, you know, Martin and I have each picked out five additional favorites here that kind of qualify and tick, tick all these boxes. So I'm going to have Martin kick us off with his first selection here. Yeah, absolutely. So I, uh, I did these in, uh, in um, level of lowest conviction to highest, but, but they, all, they all fit. So that's, that's the cool thing. So um, let's start with an absolute titan of rock and roll here that everybody would, um, you know, agree is an amazing album. Yep. Aerosmith rocks, right? Uh, you know, great record. Uh, it is my favorite Aerosmith album. You know, we have the YouTube show called The Contrarians. And we just recently did an episode where we said we can never do Aerosmith on there. At least I can't because this is a this is a widely agreed choice as best Aerosmith album. And I think it's best Aerosmith album. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about whether um, it has any stinkers on it. If it's an amazing album start to finish. And uh, and I truly believe it is. Um, you know, if if I was if I was to pick one or two that that go lower down my list, but I still love them because they're excellent examples of that of that slower funky version of the band, it would be Last Child and uh, and get the get, uh, get the let out. But um, other than that, um, you know, I I really wanted to um, you know champion this one even for Home Tonight because Aerosmith, as we all know did some terrible, horrible song doctor ballads later on in life. It started kind of with Angel. And after that, you know, the band went down a little in my estimation in terms of like, you guys are amazing writers. Don't do this outside writer thing, right? Um, but Home Tonight is a great example of a true rote proto power ballad that is an amazing song. So it's, it's a great song. And then of course, from there on in, you've got some of my favorite Aerosmith songs of all time in Lickin' a Promise, Sick as a Dog, probably Combination, um, you know, Go Down a Little, but Up in Heaviness to Rats in the Cellar and Nobody's Fault, Love Back in the Saddle. Um, but yeah, it's just start to finish. Uh, they, they cover all the bases here, in, including that loping funk thing, including the power ballad, including the technical heavy metal in Rats in the Cellar and Nobody's Fault. Beautiful, beautiful Jack Douglas production on here. Um, so yeah, I, as I see, it's, uh, it's nine songs. Uh, it's not a particularly short album. It's a perfectly fine, uh, you know, album length album. And uh, all nine songs serve a great purpose. So there you go, my number five. Yeah, I think most people would agree that um, Rocks is easily their best album start to finish you know some folks might prefer it uh, you don't meet too many of them but there are folks who every now and then throw out toys in the attic or maybe get your wings or even night in the ruts yep. as their favorite because of certain tracks but i don't think anybody will deny that that one right there from track one all the way to the end is their perfect album there's, there's really no stinkers on that album at all yeah yeah absolutely all right all right, so my first choice for today, uh, I've talked to Martin quite a bit over the last couple of weeks and originally was going to be in episode one, but I was slightly on the fence about one song. I mean, that's how down to the nitty gritty we're getting on these albums. There was one song that I was a little on the fence about and I was like, ah, you know what? I'm not gonna pick it in on the first episode for that reason. And then I went to the gym and I was re-listening to this over the course of a couple of days and I was like, yeah, you know what? That song is pretty cool, I guess. You know, maybe it's it's not it's not like in league with some of the other songs on the album, but it's still a fun song. I'm talking about Secret Treaties by Blue Oyster Cult. Uh, you know, I have a handful of Blue Oyster Cult, like real top favorites, but I think for me, this is my favorite Blue Oyster Cult album. And this is, you know, for my money, start to finish, it's just loaded with gems. I mean, from Career of Evil. You got the wonderful Subhuman, which could be my favorite BOC track of all time. The Bruising Dominance and Submission, uh, you know, ME262, which is such a fun, quirky, engaging piece. It's heavy. It's kind of, you know, it's got some pop hooks in it. The riffs are great. KG Cretans is actually the song that I was a little on the fence about. It's easily, for me anyway, the weakest track on the album, but it's still a lot of fun. It's so 
quirky and weird and kind of different for this band. But then again, I think Blue Oyster Cult specialized in doing weird and different stuff on almost every album, which is cool. So I, uh, you know, I decided, I'm like, you know what? I like that song enough to warrant including this whole album here. Harvester of Eyes, brilliant stuff. Flaming Telepaths, great rocker. And then of course, one of the great album closers of all time in astronomy. So, I mean, for me, when you talk about Blue Oyster Cult, it doesn't get any better than this. For me, this is their rocks and so many classics on it. I love the production of the album. The songwriting is just really, really intelligent and just different. And uh, I love the fact that they were a heavy band that was willing to go down avenues that a lot of their heavy bands uh, couldn't or didn't want to do. And uh, so there you go. That's my first choice, Secret Treaties. Cool, excellent. Yeah, a lot of people pick that as their favorite Blue Oyster Cult album, that whole, and and of that whole black and white period, you know, the first two definitely have some really obscure, strange things that go a little bit too far into that Dorsey, Grateful Dead, Steppenwolf kind of thing, yeah, right? Steppenwolf, and yeah. and this is this is a really immediate album, and it's got some of the great conceptual things and Imaginos related things, and that spooky album cover and stuff. And so, yeah, I've I've actually got at layout right now a really crazy Imaginos related book. That's almost not even a music book. And I did illustrations and stuff for it. And, uh, and that, that is, that is the key anchor album of that, of that whole saga with little disparate bits uh, all over the place. So very, very intelligent, very cool album. Um, but I will stop there because we're going to talk a little bit more about Blue Oyster Cult because that's my next choice. So um, <laughs> Blue Oyster Cult also, but uh, I'm more of a fan of the color album cover period of Blue Oyster Cult. Uh, we did a Contrarians where I picked Mirrors as my favorite album of theirs, but that is not the album that, um, that I'm picking for this because this is about perfect albums with, with no songs that kind of let you down. So I went with this one here, Fire of Unknown Origin. Um, surprised uh to pick this one but but i did and I'm not. um what i like about it yeah i mean we're we're at we're at a place now with blue oyster cult where i think they feel every song has to sort of count and every song has to be accessible and and at least have that small little bit of an idea that maybe it could be a hit single and uh you know this album uh is associated with the heavy metal uh soundtrack so they wrote a few songs you know to, to try to get one on the heavy metal soundtrack. And, and there was one, but there are, there are a few that, that uh, kind of fit the theme. But when I look at this, um, you know, I, I often call this album a little bit of their, um, a, like, like their post-punk album, where there's a little bit of stranglers and cars to what they're doing, even more so than anything previous, Cultosaurus or Mirrors or whatever, you know, the ramp up to this. Even Agents of Fortune, for that matter, uh, has a lot of that stranglers, doomy keyboard kind of feel to it. But everything on here, you've got all the heavy ones, which are cool. And actually, my one song on here where, I, where I'm probably least into, surprisingly, is kind of the heavy metalist song on it, heavy metal, the black and silver, but the dark tracks on here, the dark kind of new wavy tracks, like don't turn your back after dark soul survivor, these moody, mellow contemplative ones are kind of my, some of my favorites. Although Joan Crawford would probably be my absolute favorite. Burning for you is unassailable. Amazing song. Um, love, love the progginess of veterans of the psychic war. Fire of unknown origin is a great against stranglers uh, type song. I find on here. So when I look at the nine tracks of this, you know, studying these BOCs, because I knew there was one in here that was going to be perfect, right? Um, because I, I I don't like, well, yeah, let's not go into the other albums, but every, every one of them has one or two where I'm just, eh, whatever, you know, Marshall Plan or... Um, you know, Divine Wind. Um, those are the ones that actually, you know, knocked out the other ones. But uh, and then the other ones as well, D Debbie, ne Debbie Denise and stuff like that. But but no, absolutely um, no fat on this. And the last thing I want to say is it, it reminds me a little bit about the self-aware version of Black Sabbath, where there's no fat on heaven and hell and mob rules. And, you know, if this is the Martin Birch era, the Sandy Perlman managing them era. Um, there you go. Yeah, that's a great choice. If uh, if there was no secret treaties, that would have been my pick. Hmm, cool. Yeah, I, I, that's a really, really strong album. And again, uh, a different album for them. I, I like the fact that Blue to Cult was almost like reinventing themselves almost every single album. Yeah. Not, not a lot of bands did that, you know. Okay. Great choice. All right. So uh, my next one, 
And, you know, we talked in episode one about how some of these picks might not necessarily be our favorite albums from these bands, right? And I, I talk all the time about how sometimes you have attachments to certain albums. They may contain like three or four monster tracks for you personally. Um, and that elevates the album above what we may deem a perfect album from that band. Here's, a, here's another example of that. So my pick here is uh, Asia by Steely Dan. Cool. Yeah. You know, top to bottom, you can't, I mean, you can't knock its greatness, its legendary status. And it, it is so for a reason. It, however, is not my favorite Steely Dan album. All right. You know, the Royal Scam, I've always said, is my favorite Steely Dan album. I mean, this is up there. It's a top three one. But when you look at songs like Black Cow and Asia and Deacon Blues and Peg, for crying out loud, Home at Last, I Got the News, Josie. I mean, this is this is Steely Dan's kind of atmospheric, jazzy, almost easy listening. But musically speaking, it's pretty challenging stuff. Uh, this is a little bit different. This is not the rock version of Steely Dan. This is Steely Dan really um, feeling comfortable in their own skin, utilizing all these great studio players. I mean, I mean, the, the, the musicians that appear on this album, mind boggling that they were able to assemble this crew. Uh, and just so many, you know, you have the really strong deep tracks, but then half the album is you know, our Steely Dan favorites. You know, Black Cow, Asia, Deacon Blues, Peg and Josie, monster tracks right there. But that home at last and I got the news really, really strong. So I couldn't not pick this again, not my favorite, but from the band. But it's it's absolute perfection for me. Yeah. So. Wicked. Yeah. What a great choice. I mean, it'd be my second favorite by a little bit after Gaucho and uh, and Gaucho. I, I just recently watched. Uh, there's this amazing, amazing YouTube video where, where they go through the whole making of that record and how strange and bizarre and meticulous those guys were the whole time. It's it's almost like it's almost like mental health issues. Meticulous. I mean, they they just they just got really so inside it that, uh, you know, they are going for a certain thing. Um, and it's it's an admirable thing to go for, but obviously other people like the Rolling Stones would say no, this is this is stupidity, right? Yeah. Um, but well, yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the results. Reason why they took themselves off the road is because they were so obsessed and focused with yeah. making these <laughs> records. I mean, it's yeah. just like they had no time for that. They're like, you know what? We're a studio band. We want to pour all of our energy into doing this. And yeah. did that hurt them in the end? Because I mean, we know what it was like in the seventies. You had to go album tour, album tour. That's what you did. That's how you made your money. And while I think Steely Dan did very well for themselves, uh, you have to wonder if uh, deciding not to do the live thing after a couple tours and just basically putting all their energies into the albums, if that hurt them in the long run, I don't know. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, okay. So my third choice or second, yeah, third choice now um, is this record, Except Restless and Wild. Um, you know, I look at this and uh, it just so perfectly fits this concept. Again, Balls to the Wall is my favorite Except album. But um, this one, this one is, uh, is just start to finish, um, completely heavy. That's number one. Great songs, uh, songs that get to the point. When I say completely heavy, I mean that it's got its own Beyond the Realms of Death, which was one of the picks of, of the last episode in Neon Nights which uh, has its heavy parts too, um, but it's just a really cool song. Um, even, even on its own as a, as a mellow tune, it's cool, um, but then it's got the heavy parts too. So there's nothing on here that has no heaviness whatsoever, but, but the anthems on here, shake your, shake your heads ahead of the pack. You just hear these choruses in your head when just when you say the titles, right? Restless and Wild. Um, Get Ready is kind of the party one on here. Demon's Night, kind of a cool, doomy, satanics feeling one, right? Flash Rockin' Man is a bit partyous. Um, but yeah, Princess of the Dawn with that great solo at the end. So um, yeah, just start to finish. Uh, as, as they say, everyone's a banger on this, right? Yeah. Um, really, really cool album. And, and, and you can't say that about um, even Breaker, which is such a commendable album, or even even perhaps, uh, you know, uh, Metal Heart in some ways. Metal Heart, see, to, to me, the whole concept of this this idea of yours is is the idea that um you know it is it is start to finish it's not peaks and valleys at all right Absolutely. and as you just uh, you know articulated um some of those except peaks um would be on metal heart and would be on balls to the wall um but uh but in terms of uniformity of it just doesn't let you down i'll go with restless and wild yeah i think i can speak for a lot of people when that album came out that changed a lot of our lives 
Yeah. I mean, that, that album made an impact. I remember the first time I went over to a buddy's house and he put the needle on the record and that opening it was just like, what in the world is this? And still to this day, all these years later, you're absolutely correct. Start to finish that album crushes, crushes. Yeah. yeah. Really cool. All right. All right. My next pick is another one that uh, is not my favorite from this band. It's up there, uh, but start to finish it is the perfect album from these guys. This was a massive, massive seller for this band. Uh, talking about um, Point of No Return from Kansas. Yeah. I prefer, you know, if I had, if you had to say, you know, Pete, you can only take one Kansas album with you to wherever the hell you're going, uh, or even two, may not even be in, in those two, right? I often left Overture and Song for America are really, really do it for me. This album really does it for me as well, not quite on that level, but I mean, it's just every song on here is amazing. This is, you know, this band figured out how to produce quality, challenging American progressive rock, because, you know, at the time, not a lot of American prog rock bands. It's all the, all the Brits were doing this stuff. All the Europeans were doing this stuff. But, you know, here in America, you had very few bands who were actually even attempting this. Uh, but mixing that with some hard rock, because they could rock, and some, as we saw, some kind of like folky pop, right? Of course, Dust in the Wind was an enormous, enormous sensation, big hit. But you have Point of No Return, which shows those pop sensibilities of the band mixed with a little bit of that light prog rock. You got Paradox. The hooks are all over the place on here. The incredible instrumental, The Spider, which why didn't this band do more instrumentals? You listen to that and you're like, holy crap, that's absolutely amazing. Uh, Portrait He Knew, Closet Chronicles, unsung gem from this album. Uh, Lightning's Hand showed their hard rock side. You know, we'd mentioned Dust in the Wind, Spark of the, Sparks of the Tempest, another really good hard rocker with great hooks. Uh, the gorgeous Nobody's Home, you know, right? Nice, really just emotional ballad. And then the really quirky and kind of heavy and really proggy, uh, hopelessly human to uh, kind of, finish out the album the artwork is spectacular the production is just amazing by jeff glicksman i mean just uh, a monster album for the band and uh i think per you know they had a couple really strong ones afterwards and then they kind of went you know their career kind of had lots of peaks and valleys but for me left overture and this album and even monolith to an to an extent is like you know man kansas just the creative juice is absolutely flowing but to me this is their absolute perfect sensation as much as i love left overture but for me left overture has like one or two tracks that are good not great but the rest of it is like amazing and that's why it elevates it to my favorite but this start to finish perfect yeah yeah and and that and left overture is their golden period in terms of commercial success as well right even the album covers kind of have that same feel to them and beautiful you, you know beautiful production right uh just so su such rich lows and mids and highs and everything put in the right place even though there's a lot going on and you got steve walsh with his sort of uh you know he's almost like uh like a little bit of a joe lynn turner crossed with the paul rogers in terms of the phrasing and the and that bluesiness that well joe lynn turner has that too right yeah. but also also sure. your operatic technician kind of guy as well right so yeah so yeah and i always love the dueling vocals on the early kansas stuff you know between him and robbie steinhardt i mean it, you know the band is so unique they had those two you know kind of sticks did that as well you had those two unique vocalists and then you throw the violin in and all these keyboards and the crunchy hard rock guitars there's nobody doing stuff like this i mean there's a really unique band and I, you know i've heard people over the years say well kansas wasn't very original they copied everything from the you know the british prog rock giants like you know yes and uh, genesis elp and general giant and all that kind of stuff but i think they were very original actually and, and threw like an american spin on it they were also fans of southern rock because they're from you know the kind of midwest the southern midwest there and there was like an earthiness to their music i think i don't know just i, I love kansas and uh, i just think a really really important band and that I, you know, when you look at like the history of rock and roll, I don't just don't think they get their due. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. All right. Okay, so my second uh, from top choice, I'm going to go with this one. Clash, give them enough rope. Um, 
you know, I we did a contrarians where I picked this as my favorite because a lot of people would pick London Calling as the favorite. Um, this is not really well. This is a this is a fairly punky album, definitely in spirit. It's heavy. It's explosive. It's got those those uh, you know harsh Joe Strummer um, vocals on it. It's produced by Sandy Perlman. It often gets a lot of abuse for being their quote unquote heavy metal album or like too polished or something like that. It's not polished at all. But I I went and played this in the car start to finish just to make sure uh and it absolutely is amazing it's got the good um kind of mellower stuff like all the young punks julie's in the drug squad which is a little bit swing feel to that stay free about uh you know i think it was mick that had a buddy who was in prison and it's, it's kind of about that but then it's got the really explosive political songs like safe european home english civil war tommy gun our band in the 80s played tommy gun believe it or not drug stabbing time is such a really cool fun riff um but yeah, just just a, a great uh, mix of a, of a of a killer rhythm section, just very aggressive and and great guitars. And, um, you know, you always uh, this in this idea of perfection, there's always this idea of what do you do with a band that is butted up, you know, right up against a double album of theirs that, that it's just so universally. I, I think I think in a lot of polls. London Calling won the greatest album of 1979 uh, over over a lot of albums. It's a it's a masterpiece, uh, but it definitely it, it is a long album and it's going to have a few that you're not going to like very much. And it's not punky at all. It's just not even very heavy. Right. They, they made a super about face. But this is this is the one where you get kind of like the longer, more well arranged songs versus the debut, which is which is definitely shorter songs and punkier and and more rudimentary. This is this is not particularly rudimentary. Um, you know, a lot of Clash fans do find it um, almost like a little bit too good or something, but I don't mind good. Um, you know, that's 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 fine for me. So yeah, this this was this was a no brainer choice. As I, as I went through them, I just realized every song is uh, is just uh, incredible on this. And I just wanted to mention, you know, in that same realm of. Um, you know, albums that it's hard to convince someone who wasn't there at the time, like, like, you know, there has to be a nostalgia factor, I think, with certain things that are like the Stooges or New York Dolls or any punk, right? It, uh, you had to have been there or whatever, because um, it's, you know, the magic and the beauty of, of some records for us is in the nostalgia, very, very much counter to something like a Kansas record where you could play for someone and say this is this is a masterpiece on an objective level when it comes to things like punk where it's about the uh, the abstract artness or the vibe or the times or whatever it's hard to take something really old and go take a listen to this because it's pretty easy not to sound impressive right and along that same thing where you know I had mentioned the water boys last time and and the idea with with bands that a lot of people maybe don't know about here's another here's another great one the chameleons uk strange times I've played this record hundreds of times uh, over the last bunch of years. It's so dark and moody and proggy, but it's a post-punk band and it's a post-punk album. It's a little bit like the Smiths crossed with Joy Division crossed with uh, Pink Floyd, I'd say. And then another one is Manic Street Preachers. Um, you know, it, everything must go. A lot of people will pick the Holy Bible, but I, I went and checked this again. So again, in this in this area that is not our usual area, I just wanted to mention both of these uh, in conjunction with the Clash as two that I, I, I figured I, I couldn't talk about at length. Um, but yeah, everything on everything must go is amazing, even though people will pick the Holy Bible. I'm horrified horrified when people compare the manic street preachers or put them into brit uh brit pop because i hate brit pop i hate everything about oasis and all those brit pop bands manic street preachers not a brit pop band so there you go my number two back to what is it i, I even forget now what it was it was clash there you go <laughs> I, I i did want to comment on that clash album cover right i mean sometimes some of these classic uh, you know perfect albums have like that album cover that's kind of iconic too i mean that's just a great album cover and i do want to say that, that one that you just pulled up there we, we pr probably have some folks that are going to be watching who have never heard that band they're like oh my god it looks like a prog rock album cover i need to get that because it totally screams that look at that this one yeah that's as prog as you get right i mean come yeah, on. They, they had a few other albums this is a really super well-regarded cult band and this is kind of their masterpiece uh, i think it's what is it 1989 something like that it's uh and uh yeah 86 86 for this one so they had some earlier ones some later ones they reformed but uh, I would I would advise people to check this out if you're into Pink Floyd, Joy Division, Magazine, 
Um, who else is moody and dark like this? It's it's really got a lot of and it's it's well recorded and it's got a lot of acoustic guitar on it. It's not particularly punk. It's a little bit post punk. And then yeah, love this band to death as well. So there you go. Cool. All right. So you were just talking about that whole nostalgia factor and how sometimes um, certain albums based on when they kind of came into your life, right, have, have that long lasting impact. Uh, that couldn't be any more of a perfect, perfect or segue or better segue into the album I'm going to talk about next. So, you know, when the 80s kind of, and you remember, Martin, when the 80s was winding down and we were moving into the 90s, you know, in the 80s we had um, you know, thrash metal became very, very popular. You had this whole commercial hard rock and metal, the, the glam metal, the hair metal, whatever the hell you want to call it, uh, was really big. And then all of a sudden, as the 80s started winding down and we moved into the 90s, there was that shift, right? All of a sudden, you had the whole Seattle scene, grunge and alternative, and, you know, the uh, emergence of hip hop and rap and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, for me, as a big metalhead in the 80s, uh, all of a sudden, a lot of the metal bands we were listening to were changing their sound to fit in with the times or disappearing or going back into the underground. And I mean, I got really disenchanted with the with the metal scene for a number of years in the 90s. So um, there was one band that came out of nowhere that just rocked my world, knocked my socks off and totally pushed me down the progressive rock and progressive metal rabbit hole. And there was one album that did it. I think everybody knows what I'm talking about here. Uh, Images and Words by Dream Theater. Uh, you know, this album was a game changer for so many people, myself included. And it just totally like turned me into a different direction to begin to appreciate all sorts of other bands that obviously, you know, influenced these guys themselves. Uh, but bands that I had listened to on and off throughout my life that I never really fully jumped into because predominantly I was listening to hard rock and metal. So, uh, but this album, I mean, the production is amazing. You know, David Prater, just, it just squeaky clean. I remember I had heard their debut album, you know, a year, year and a half before this came out and thinking that's pretty cool musically, but the vocalist wasn't great. And I was like, you know, the production wasn't great, but you know, I appreciated the style of music. And then I heard Pull Me Under on the radio one day. I remember like it was yesterday, I was sitting in the shower uh, I was living at my parents for a brief time in the early 90s there and, uh, you know, just fresh out of college and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, who the hell is that? Is that like some new Fate's Warning track? Is that like a new Rush track with like maybe a different singer? Like, what is that? And they're like, oh, it's brand new from Dream Theater. I'm like, oh, that's that Long Island band that my buddy from Long Island turned me on to. That doesn't sound like that album I heard. And then, you know, of course, went out and bought this and everybody was talking about it at the time. But man, Pull Me Under, you know, I've heard it way too many times, but it's still a great song. Another Day is just absolutely gorgeous. The melodies this band and creates, the vocal harmonies that James Labrie and the other guys uh, can execute, amazing. Killer musicians, right? Uh, John Petrucci, what a guitar player. John Mayung, what a, what a bass player. You got Mike Portnoy on the drums. Um, you know, you got uh, amazing keyboards. Take the Time, really catchy song. Surrounded great vocal harmonies you got metropolis complex heavy progressive metal under a glass moon sick instrumental exchanges on that but really memorable the gorgeous wait for sleep and then of course probably my favorite song in the album learning to live which is the big 11 minute epic to end the album and uh, these guys did great epics they still do learning to live so memorable so melodic yet really moody at times and i think this just you know many people still cite this as the best album they ever did for me it's in their top three. I think I like one album a little bit better, but um, it's just an amazing album that still to this day, I mean, all these years later, still sounds really fresh. And I still get those warm and fuzzies listen to, and I never skip any track on here. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And uh, yeah, started up a whole progressive metal movement. There were bands who did it before them. You know, we got to give credit to Queensryche and Fate's Warning, and you can talk about Rush and Rainbow and all that kind of stuff. But I think these guys, found that formula and we've had so many bands in their wake who have gone down a similar pathway that of course they obviously got and took their influence from other bands but i think these guys made it kind of cool to do music like this yeah yeah it, it's funny it, it's almost like um they're such musicologists and music fans the the idea was almost like design the perfect progressive metal band it's it's almost like 
rush is has gone off in a direction we we don't we don't like anymore what would what would be the perfect rush album right now right and yeah. and uh you know fate's warning is is going off in a little contemplative direction queen's reich's changing um so so it's it's literally almost like the frankensteining together of uh, of the perfect berkeley born kind of uh you know um progressive metal juggernaut and uh and it, you know it it, it it's there, uh, there's a bit of a corollary to the idea of of you know how we talked about the uh the songs that iron maiden would pick to cover and then do this great heavy metal version of it it's like they're thinking like fans and dream theater is completely and same with metallica when they did covers right but yeah. dream theater is thinking exactly like fans at this point so they're just tapping right into all the complaints you had as a progressive metal fan up to this point and saying yeah you you want you want you want perfect progressive metal here it is right yeah and you bring up a good point because like mike portnoy who was, was at the time the de facto sort of leader of the band uh is the biggest fan of all i mean this guy loves genesis and rush and gentle giant and slayer and Metallica and Iron Maiden and Black Sabbath and Deep Purple. He he's just like us. Loves all these bands. And uh, you know, this guy. I mean, I, I've seen Dream Theater more than any other band live. I've seen them countless times. Wow. And he was the driving force behind them wanting to do all of these like full-on cover shows where they would do like entire albums by all these prog and metal bands. He's the guy who insisted that they change up their set list on every night of every tour, right? He's the guy who's on all the message boards and talking to the fans and, uh, you know, showing his album collections and, and all this kind of, I mean, he is a, he's an ultimate like music geek yeah. and he makes no bones about it. And I think that's what was always so cool about this band and why so many of us related so well to them is because they had an understanding of how we felt as, as the fan base, right? Yeah. Cool. Right on. Okay. Um, all right. So my, uh, my last choice, my top choice is uh, this uh, bad boy right here or bad girl, depending on how, what you, uh, what you think. Um, so yeah, queen, queen one. So essentially um, I like this choice because this is one of the three albums that always pop into my head. When people say, what's your favorite album of all time, it's physical graffiti or sabotage or this one. Those are the three that always come to mind. And what I love about this record. Well, what I love about queen number one is I also always say that, that the only two runs of complete utter objective genius in the, in the rock world period ever were the Queen albums in the 70s and the Priest albums in the 70s. Nothing else, you know, people start rattling off bands immediately right after. And, you know, it, it, it gets into like, well, Aerosmith was good. Bruce Springsteen was good. U2 was good in their run or whatever. When you, but when you start talking about those bands, it's like, it's like, well, now, now you're into opinion and liking songs. To me, Queen and Priest was just like genius. Um, just you know the progressiveness and the production and the ideas and the writing um and what i like about this one in particular um across this theme is that those other records of genius that queen had always had a few things that kind of rubbed you the wrong way whether it was the 1920s music on it or or a little kind of like boring blues or a little you know just piano and freddie singing or whatever the cool thing about this is that Pretty much everything on it is quite progressive. And then even the slightly mellow things like Night Comes Down or Doing All Right are just like, there's so many fresh and cool and fun ideas across them that you're never bored. They're, they're not just rote ballads in any way. And then of course, you've got the, you know, the Titanic epic kind of heavy proggy things like Keep Yourself Alive and Liar and, uh, and even Seven Seas of Rye, which is, you know, more up-tempo and energetic, but Jesus, Son and Daughter, um, Modern Times Rock and Roll, one of the, the very heaviest songs ever written as of 1973 right um com completely just blasting heavy metal even in a way that sabbath and deep purple couldn't do because queen is also adding that you know all those free hours spent at, at trident uh you know working on different ideas to get the the production even just so incredibly crushing that it that is actually heavier than than things uh you know other proper heavy metal bands were doing bands that spent most of their time doing heavy metal right um but yeah, Great King Rat, My Fairy King, you know, it's just just action packed idea after idea after idea, whether it's a proggy idea, a heavy idea, a mellow idea. Um, 
and it, it just there was nothing like it at the time as well. Um, and and there never was. I mean, there, there's very few bands. There, there's no category of bands who tried to copy Queen. Uh, anywhere along the way and uh, and to, to have that all happen on the first album and and to and to have that first album be so good that um, it fits this concept where start to finish you're never bored uh, is 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 pretty darn amazing from any band from a band on their first album so there you go queen one yeah a um, couple comments on that that's a great choice and I think there's probably going to be a lot of people who would automatically want to pick a night at the opera. Uh, and including me, when we were talking about doing this and I was putting together a list of possibilities, uh, I was like, well, that would be like the obvious choice. And then I started going through the track list. I'm like, mm, there's like a track or two on here that are okay, but doesn't make it perfect. And then when I saw you were going to pick that album, I was like, yeah, that's the one. That's the one. There is not a weakness on that entire album. And I, and I want to say this. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I see comments from people all the time who want to try and bash Queen as this boring pop band who never did anything, you know, remotely rock and roll. And I'm like, but what have you listened to from this band? Because I find it hard to believe that you have, haven't, if you're going to make that statement, that you've listened to Queen 1 or Queen 2 or Sheer Heart Attack or News of the World, Jazz, Day at the Races. I mean, there's like some of the heaviest stuff of the 70s are on these albums. Yeah. I mean, that first album is, if that isn't like early heavy metal, I don't know what it is. Yeah. I mean, this band is way more... Then we are the champions. Another one bites the dust. Crazy little thing called love and uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah, all great songs. Don't get me wrong. Just want to mention one other thing. I mean, this I have called this my favorite album of of all time. But over years, it almost fits more in this. And I've found other Queen albums that that I even like even more. Like I've I like jazz possibly even more than this now in certain ways. Terrific. And again. Night of the Opera is is unassailable too, but you know I, when I looked at jazz, I, I realized it wasn't going to fit this concept because there are a few songs I like a little bit less. But I, I like the overall brightness and shortness and and energetic little bursts on jazz possibly more. So it changes over time. There are there are definitely other great great Queen albums, but uh, but this is one that I've often yeah called called favorite of all. Yeah, I mean we could derail this whole show and talk all about Queen, but I think jazz is one of Queen's most underrated albums because like exactly like you said there are explosive bursts on that album of absolute greatness maybe start to finish it's not quite as strong as that debut or or even night at the opera but man there are tracks on that album that are absolutely sensational i think people tend to forget how good jazz is yeah man what a great band oh, talk about queen all day but I, I love that choice martin uh cool. that is easily one of the best debuts of all time that doesn't get talked about enough right yeah yeah all right, so my final choice of today and probably uh, for me, the definition of what this whole show is all about. And, and, and man, I played this the other day and I was once again, just kind of like dumbfounded at how amazingly lush and beautiful and just perfect this album is. Um, and I almost wore the shirt today, but I figured that would give the whole thing away. Uh, Crime of the Century by Supertramp. You know, one of those bands that are really hard to kind of categorize. I think at their at their heart, at their soul, they were a really good British pop band. Uh, and we're talking like 70s pop, right? But uh, they could rock. They knew their progressive rock. They knew their blues. They knew their jazz. They had a little bit of psych early on. But man, it all just kind of comes out in this album. And it's just start to finish so wonderful. And again, we've talked a couple times about these bands that have like multiple singers. And I think Supertramp always works so well because you had both of these guys who had very different voices adding these unique flavors throughout their albums and songs. But man, it just, you know, school starts right off the bat. So gorgeous. Uh, Bloody Well Right is the big, obviously memorable song from this album. Uh, Hide in Your Shell, terrific track. I love the jazziness of some of these songs. Asylum, breathtaking. Dreamer is another. This is that, that kind of pop side of the band. You know, Roger Hodgson was a, a really good writer of these little pop ditties. Uh, then you got the absolutely dramatic Rudy, breathtaking, if everyone was listening. And then, of course, the epic closer title track, Crime of the Century. 
just there's so much drama there's so much dynamics on this album the instrumentation is like you know not one of those bands that throws all these like you know guitar and keyboard solos they didn't need to uh but just really tight rhythms and instrumentation perfectly placed guitars and piano and keyboards and saxophone or whatever they use everything had its place and it all just made absolutely perfect sense uh, the, and, the, and the production of this album uh by kent scott and the band just absolutely stunning i mean sometimes i listen to this album from a production standpoint and it's almost on the level of like a dark side of the moon it's just a beautiful beautiful sounding record so yeah there you have it you're 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 being sent to dark side of the moon also by that album cover right I mean, yeah, like, pretty much. I mean, yeah, pretty that, much. That feel, yeah, I and I love even the quietest moments in Breakfast in America as well. They, those guys, they they almost strike me as like like uh, uh, an accessible A uh, and R hammered to death version of Gentle Giant in a way, right? Yeah, you know, like like if if Gentle Giant was twice as commercial as they were, and and put it and 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 you know worked harder on getting the production and the tightness and everything down, and threw out songs and added other songs or whatever, they'd end up at Super Tramp essentially with the with the mix of what they're doing, right? Yeah, there's an eclecticism, if that's a word, right? That of that both bands kind of have. Yeah, which I think is similar, but you know, it's 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 just interesting how like nobody's ever you're, we're always like unable to pigeonhole Super Tramp. Like, what were they? Yeah. Like they really weren't a prog band. They, they weren't just a strict pop band. They weren't a typical rock band. It's kind of like uh, Alan Parsons project too. It's like, you know, they kind of dabble in all these different things and, and do it really so well. But uh, yeah. And you mentioned a couple of the super trip albums. They, they had a run of like what, four or five of them that are just like you know, yeah. really special albums. But for me, this is their, that's their magnum opus. They have other great ones, but uh, yeah, that's, Perfect cool, album. Cool. And so, so amazing to listen yeah. to. Yeah, as many I just want to like mention a, a couple other honorable mentions just to, just to squeeze in a couple things here, right? Because we, we talked about, you know, are you really being true to the, the concept with this? And these are ones I almost stuck in. Well, this, this one, no problem. I mean, animals, absolutely. I would put animals in, but uh, you know, I looked long and hard at Dio uh, last in line and I looked at Holy Diver and uh, last in line came closest, but uh you know, I went and played Mystery again, and I just, uh, I just, that little keyboard thing in there just, just sent me, uh, you know, it just triggered me, right? Uh, but really everything else, um, and, you know, Egypt, the chains are on is the slow one on here, but there's, there's the even slower one on Holy Diver, which, which was the one that, uh, Shame on the Night, I think it's called, right? Um, that, that knocked that one out for me. So I had that as an honorable mention. And then, you know, my favorite UFO album, we did a Contrarians on this. A lot of people gave me a lot of hell for calling this my favorite UFO album. I don't care. Uh, it totally is produced by George Martin. And why I almost wanted to put this one in there was um, I just love the uh, the Rolling Stonesy songs, the heavy songs, the bluesy cover, which is totally heavy. I love the poppy songs, but I I, I really don't like the one kind of piano we ballad on it, right? Which is a take it or leave it. But the but the mellow tunes on on this record. Somebody, you know, you, if you're a UFO fan and you don't know this record, go play any day and gone in the night again. Um, great dark, cool mellow tunes uh, on this record, but it, but it but it couldn't quite fit. So those are my honorable mentions. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> good choices yeah. all right so uh as martin and i discussed before we went on the air uh we are going to continue this show martin is is, is going to be stepping aside from the perfect album series to allow other uh, of our online or on-air personalities to come yeah in. i i basically told pete i can't think of any more that that are going to be true and sincere in this because my honorable mentions even had problems and then i also said i would love to see you do this with a couple of these other guys because I'm I'm dying to see their opinions on on this whole perfect album thing. So I just figured, yeah, let's like you know go go get those guys on this if you want to continue this. So that's what we're gonna do. So because I still have a list of of albums that I haven't uh, talked about yet. So uh, so Martin will be watching, but he'll step aside to allow some other folks to take a stab at this as well. So look for that over the coming weeks. However, Martin and I are coming back next Friday. Uh, because that's what we do here uh, with a really cool concept that I think we're both pretty jazzed about. So how about those kind of poor or mediocre follow-ups to mega albums? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so basically, you know, a band that puts out this album that is acclaimed and sells millions and millions of copies and they're riding high. And then that follow-up to it, 
sinks like a turd in a toilet right so uh so that's what we're going to be and you know again uh we'll have to we'll be discussing together the kind of criteria is like well was it a bad seller was it just a poorly written and recorded album uh you know how how much did it pale in comparison right because there are some follow-ups to big mega albums that sell really well but as we kind of look back on them we're like yeah that really wasn't that good it sold like it did just because it had some carryover from the big album so we're going to be kind of using a lot of these different criteria to to judge us and we're going to come up with five each so that's where that's next friday so stay tuned for that i'm i'm pretty stoked for that one because uh i've already got a couple in mind but um very cool yeah 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 that'll be interesting for yeah. sure so that's coming up a week from today, everybody. Uh, Martin, uh, you want to plug any book stuff uh, that's happening with you? Um, well, lots happening soon, but not lot, not a lot happening now. I mean, I did do the Angel reprint, and I've got about 60, 70 of those left. So there's an Angel book. Uh, the Sweet book, I get back from the printer in about five, six days. So I'll have a Sweet book called Rebel Rouser, a Sweet User Manual. And then uh, in late March, early April, I'll have the last of the Rush trilogy, uh, which is called Driven, Rush in the 90s, and in quote marks, uh, in the end. So lots coming, but not a lot right now. Actually, and with my layout guy, I have that uh, very odd uh, Imaginos related, the occult origins of World War I uh, book with illustrations by me, like about 39 il illustrations or something. So that's going to be really, uh, really different because it's not even really a music book. So yeah, and martinpopoff.com for, uh, for all this stuff, except the new stuff, which isn't there yet, but everything that's in print, martinpopoff.com. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, let's see. Upcoming on the program here this weekend, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, day uh, day 13 of uh, albums that are turning 50 years old here in 2021 from 1971. And then Sunday, we got a busy day Sunday. So we've got uh, myself, Sidney Taylor and Rich Catino. We're each giving you our 10 favorite albums from Swedish guitar sensation Ingve Malmsteen. Uh, Lynn Versace and I are going to do a fun little program about the, our favorite heavy song, uh, no, our favorite mellow songs from heavy bands. And then a special kind of impromptu uh, show that we just planned this morning uh, after the passing of Chick Corea the other day. We're going to, uh, myself, Mike Antonelli and George Lemie are going to give you, it's going to be an impossible task, but we're going to do it anyway, our 10 favorite albums that Chick Corea ever appeared on. So that's happening uh, on Sunday as well. So stay tuned for all this and lots more. And of course, set your calendars for Monday night, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hudson Valley Squares will be going live once again, taking all your questions and feedback and getting into a live discussion with all of our viewers. So uh, that'll be happening Monday night. So see you all then. And for Martin Popoff, I am Pete Pardo. Have a good weekend, everybody.